the title of this panel is Law and Economics, and it will be moderated by Richard Gilbert. Uh, Richard was educated at the other major university in the Bay Area, where he received his PhD in 1976, the same year he joined UC Berkeley as an assistant professor. He became a full professor in 1983. His research is in industrial organization and regulation with an emphasis on con competition policy, innovation, and intellectual property. He is currently a professor emeritus. He served as chair of Berkeley's economics department from 2002 to 2005. He also previously was deputy assistant attorney general for economics within the US Department of Justice and was director of the UC Energy Institute. He was a Fulbright Scholar in 1989 and was a visiting fellow at Churchill College, University of Cambridge in 1979 and 2006. Rich. Thank you very much, Randy. Uh, we have a great panel, lots of different perspectives. Um, so I'm just gonna say a few words and then introduce our panelists. Um, so Gordon and I go, and I go way back. Uh, we even had a consulting company together at one point. And, I think we even go back before that consulting company. Uh, and it turns out that we have uh, a lot of similar interests, uh, particularly in the, in, when it comes to intellectual property uh, and mergers. Uh, and he's written some nice papers uh, with Alan Marco from the economics department. Uh, and it's very related. I can get a chance to plug a book that I'm writing on antitrust and innovation. And his papers make a point, um, uh, I think that's a very important point in this area. One question is what do mergers do uh, for investments in research and development and generally innovation? And there's surprisingly little work on this topic. Uh, and what little work there is on this topic, most of it has a fundam fundamental flaw. And the flaw is that it doesn't understand or appreciate the firms merge for a reason. Uh, and often the reason has to do with their research and development and innovation prospects. Uh, and Gordon's papers highlight that point, and I, and I think it's, it's really, really very important. Uh, and, and it's a quite current issue. I, in fact, I was a um, consultant for Dow and DuPont uh, in the merger of their crop protection business. So I actually know a little bit about crop protection and agriculture uh, from that merger. Uh, and that merger, um, it wound up uh, uh, ending in, a, in one of the largest divestitures, I think, of any merger. Uh, they divested all of DuPont's crop protection business uh, over at the European Commission. The European Commission insisted on this to improve to, before they would approve the merger. Uh, and one of their uh, basis for their decision was they looked and saw that there's been a lot of mergers in the ag uh, crop protection business and research intensity defined by R&D expenditures uh, for sales uh, has been going down in that industry. Well, that's fine, but they never did look at that issue of why are firms merging? Does it make a difference? Does, is it the fact that the firms are merging maybe because their research prospects are going down? Uh, so very current issue. I think we'll be able to talk about that. Um, so let me, I want to introduce our panel. Um, we're going to start off with Michael Housefield, uh, who is chairman of Housefield LLP. Uh, it's, Michael is a leading class action antitrust attorney. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot from Michael. Uh, then we're going to go to Jeff Perloff, professor and chair of the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics here at Berkeley. Uh, I want to congratulate you, Jeff, on being chair. We know how the good that is. Uh, it may not be the greatest job, but I did find out that you know, when you're chair, the good thing about being chair is that for all your friends who are not academics or your family, they think you're the smartest one. <laughs> which may or may not be true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, no, no, I wouldn't say that uh, necessarily. Uh, then uh, we're going to hear from Gareth McCartney. Gareth is partner, senior economist, and director of competition uh, analytics at OnPoint, Gordon's very own consulting company. And then uh, Martin Sturmer, senior research economist at the Federal Reserve. 
Bank of Dallas. Uh, and thank you, Martin, for coming all the way out from Dallas, really. To oh, the it's nice to be in California, right? Well, to the People's <laughs> Republic, even of Berkeley. That's no great. No tornadoes and yeah. good. Uh, so, Michael, would you like to begin? Um, I, I'm honored uh, not only to be here today um, to honor Gordon, but to, to say that I had the pleasure as well as the honor of working with Gordon over a number of years um, on an issue that I'd like to focus on in terms of from a practitioner's practical point of view, um, what, is, what is the challenge between law and economics? And um, I've, I've got a, a slide which um, I, I think highlights from a, a particular perspective of um, antitrust cartel uh, analysis as to what I believe one of the major problems that needs to be addressed is. In the United States, there was a litigation called rail freight fuel surcharge. And in that, um, there was a question of whether or not the major rail carriers got together to essentially agree not to compete on the application or implementation of a fuel surcharge during a period of rising fuel costs. <coughs> the court essentially um, accepted the model as being based on reliable scientific principles and in accordance with applicable scientific me methodology. Having said that, however, the court then went on to hear from the defense expert who basically criticized the model through a, a variation of looking at um, or analyzing different data points and coming to different conclusions. And on appeal, the Court of Appeals took what I considered to be the jingle approach. The jingle approach was despite the fact that the model was reliable, they felt that the model, because it was criticized, was no model. So if there was no model, there was no damage, and therefore there could be no class, and the case basically you know, um, self-destructed. That was an example of the fact that you had two economists with two different, different points of view that were able to look at the data, come up with different conclusions, and were able to criticize the data, which is easier to do than it is to build on a positive explanation of the data. It turned out as well that the, the jingle, no model, no damage, you know, um, underscores the fact that the model fit the facts of the case, which are not considered in the jingle at all. How did the model reflect the reality of what was observed in the market? Then we move over um, to Canada, which took a, that takes a much less intense approach on the validity of um, economics in terms of producing precision with regard to result, as opposed to suggestions based on its fit you know, with um, actual observations in the market. And there, the methodology only needs to be sufficiently credible and plausible in order to create an inference to support the court to allow the case to proceed different than what the United States jurists look at. We then complicate that by the decision recently in the UK, which looked at what we call the compensatory principle, which is everyone who is injured by an antitrust violation has an absolute right to recover. What problem does that present? Well, in this particular case, dealing with the use of a credit card, a class was brought on behalf of credit card users against the major banks, arguing that the major banks conspired you know, to fix the price. That inflated the cost of the card. The flaw in the reasoning that the lower court found, or the, the Court of Competition Appeal, found that despite um, the economics or the economist who said, we can overcome the problems of not having sufficient verification of who bought what and whether or not there was actually an inflation of what was bought by reason of the cost increase you know, uh, in the cost of the credit transaction. 
and basically dismissed the case, said you cannot prove this case because there, there will never be sufficient economics, you know, either by methodology or principle, which, which would substantiate the claim. In that case, there was the additional complication, you know, um, to the amusement of some of the jurists, that they threw out both sets of economists, one for the complainant and one for the defense, and put their own economist in. And then over and above their own economists, what they did is they rejected all the economic theories and applied their own understanding of what the economics should have produced and came to the result that because you could not trace an overall overcharge to an individual customer's credit card user's injury because the overcharge was aggregate and it would only be on average, so therefore you would never know whether or not a particular card was used at a time when it, a store may have been giving discounts so that you don't know if they were overcharged or not depending upon the cost of the transaction. The Court, the, um, court of Appeals said that the, the vindication of the rights of the individual claimants, meaning even if you could not prove that an individual was actually injured, that, uh, th that the rights of those individual claimants is achieved by the aggregate award itself, bypassing all of the economics and essentially creating a tension with the compensatory principle because you're going to have within this large body of millions of credit card users, individuals who could not be established to have been injured by reason of, of the uh, infringement. All of which underlies what I feel um, is a flaw right now in the system of the intersection of law and economics. And that is, the um, need to educate the judges, not just in the United States, but right now because of um, issues which are litigated around the world, um, to educate the judges on how to understand economics, how to accept economics, how to apply economics to situations not merely involving in, in cartels or in mergers and acquisitions, or in issues of big tech, or what is now the big debate as to whether or not consumer welfare is the appropriate economic standard you know, to judge in issues, not only you know, in democratic issues, not only, as we heard this morning, in climate change issues. There is, a, there is an absence of an understanding at the judiciary level, which at one point was addressed by the Chicago School which held seminars and conferences around the United States to educate the judges, unfortunately, with a particular point of view, as opposed to a balanced point of view, as to what the role of the law and economics were. In fact, now um, we were talking to Jeff, and, and uh, there's the issue of hot tubbing, you know, that, that's got started in Australia, which now you know, has become utilized more and more in the United States. And one judge asked me, do I understand what hot tubbing is? And I said that when <clears throat> competitors in an industry get together in a hot tub, you know, um, that is an example of naked price fixing. <laughs> <laughs> but you have all of these um, efforts by the courts to try to understand economics, but at the same time not wanting to feel you know, that um, they are being lectured in an economic seminar as to the principles, ultimately not necessarily producing the most either efficient or ideal result. I consider this a three-legged stool. We've got to um, educate the practitioners in terms of their understanding of getting beyond the veneer of the economics and basically bullying the economics into the positions that they want. We have to get to the courts to basically understand how best to apply and, and appreciate what the economics can or cannot say with or without precision or within an ambient of range, you know, but you'll still certainty. And we have to educate as well the public in understanding the economic principles as they actually, as, as um, uh, 
was said th this, this morning by, by Joe Stiglitz in terms of what are the practical implications of economics in terms of social um, and personal welfare. Thank you, Michael. Those are lots of issues that I'm sure we're going to have a chance to talk about. Uh, I want to give everyone an opportunity to say a few words, and then we'll get back uh, together, and, and I hope to leave a little time for questions from the group as well. So, Jeff? I hope you'll forgive me. I hope you'll forgive me if I start by talking on a slightly off-topic uh, point. I just want to start by thanking Gordon uh, for creating the modern Agriculture and Resource Economics Department. He came from Harvard, uh, took over what was largely a moribund uh, uh, department consisting of dinosaurs of my current age or older and two or three young punk assistant professors, and within a... a a few years, both as uh, chair of the department and as dean of the college, he built it up into the number one ranked uh, agriculture and resource economics department. Thank you, Gordon. Um, uh, then, since Gordon tells me what to do, Gordon told... <laughs> uh, he didn't tell me to t make that initial point, but everything... <laughs> Uh, he said, uh, why don't you talk, well, why don't you tell a joke? I couldn't think of a good joke on this topic. So then his second guess was, why don't you discuss how modern uh, economics, and particularly industrial organization economics, uh, can inform uh, uh, antitrust uh, litigation or fail to inform it? Uh, I think this is a, a really hot topic today. There are lots of topics that are coming up that are on the cutting edge of economic research. Uh, that are raising gigantic problems uh, uh, for our society. For example, net neutrality uh, in two-sided markets. Uh, this is uh, uh, a definitely a cutting edge issue. As such, I'll skip it. Uh, I'm going to discuss a somewhat older uh, example, and that's of predation. Um, predations were a firm uh, uh, prices very low, drives out all the competition, and then raises its price and thereby benefits from doing that, or at least that's the story. Uh, this idea has been around for ages. Uh, typically, the idea is the, the firm that does it has deep pockets, and it's driving out little uh, uh, late entrants. Uh, uh, the problem is there wasn't a real good economic theory about this, and all kinds of weird law developed as a result. But this is very important. Uh, not only does it happen in uh, domestic markets, but today uh, an important issue is dumping in international markets. We accuse other countries of uh, China charging too little for their solar panels or things of this sort, and then we're going to retaliate against them in certain ways. Uh, um, in addition, uh, and this is an idea I frankly didn't know until I came across one of Gordon's paper, uh, paper Gordon and Foote, they pointed out that they, there's a sort of mirror image of the story I just told, which they call predatory bidding, uh, and they pointed to the Wirehouse case. Anyway, for years, there was complete confusion on the topic, and then along came a lawyer and an economist, Dorita and Turner, and they came up with a rule, and they said, look, this is only going to make sense if we can price, uh, if, if firms are pricing below marginal costs, that's the cost of the, the, the producing the next unit. Before that, sort of implicitly what was going on is was if they were pricing below uh, total cost um, or average cost. Uh, and the story really can't make a great deal of sense uh, uh, because you can think of lots of firms uh, who are pricing below cost without any evil intent, without trying to drive others out of the market. For example, a firm comes along, it introduces a new product, and very often it uh, charges a low introductory rate or gives it away for free. This is for obviously a very different purpose, yet it would clearly violate any rule that said if you ever price below cost, uh, you're violating, uh, you're acting as a predator. Uh, the second issue that sort of uh, emerged from this is you've got to be, that they made clear, is you've got to be able to uh, recoup it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense for you to charge a low price, drive them out of the market, 
and then raise your price, and as soon as you do that, somebody else is going to come flooding back into the market. So it has to be rational, and the, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Matushita case said, yeah, uh, you know, you've accused these uh, Japanese firms of uh, pricing below cost for 20 years. Oh, come on, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, since then, economists have been very involved in trying to point out what some of the issues are. Uh, unfortunately, Rita Turner, while they, they helped clarify the argument, they came up with a rule that said, as Michael pointed out, uh, sometimes you don't have really good data. We really want to know what the marginal cost is. We might not know that. It's probably easier to come up with the average variable cost. I, I apologize to the non-economists in the room for the, the jargon. The problem is, uh, the economist pointed out, that doesn't make sense except for uh, an equilibrium in the short run in a competitive market, which are exactly the markets where we don't care about this uh, because the behavior uh, makes no sense. Um, similarly, uh, there was a lot of work in game theory about how if you drive out the firms, you've got to be able to prevent them from re-entering. Uh, uh, Another argument that the economists came up with is there are a lot of other strategic behavior that would be correlated or replace this. Uh, why are we f fixating on, uh, on uh, predation? And then several people pointed out that there are counter strategies. For example, uh, a new entrant could make a deal with uh, uh, customers and say, we'll, we'll charge you a fixed price uh, for a given amount of period, and that would counteract uh, predation. Uh, and then finally, another paper by uh, uh, Justin Rouser pointed out that there's an asymmetry uh, in the predation uh, story, uh, that the normal predation story and the pred uh, predatory bidding story uh, have, uh, there's an asymmetry that arises in those cases. I don't want to go through all these details and any more point, but uh, the interesting thing is all this, uh, Analysis has gotten us almost nowhere. Consider California. Uh, after all these uh, suggestions of how we could do it better, our law and indeed how our courts have largely interpreted it is we're all the way back in the old days where if you're ever priced below cost, you're technically predating. Whereas other jurisdictions have paid t attention to this. So it's a kind of unbalanced story, perhaps similar to what Michael was pointing out. Thanks. Um Jeff, uh, and next is David. David, I think I might have skipped over you in our introductions. I apologize. I have trouble counting to five. Uh, so, <laughs> David is uh, the Thomas J. Graff Chair in the College of Natural Resources, and he's a professor also in the college. Um, and uh, actually, David and I go back to the economics department. He's an econ graduate, so so we go back a ways as well. Yeah, uh, we do. So. David? Yeah, thanks, Rich. Well, I'll tell you, for me, one of the treats of teaching at the place where you got your PhD is days like today. Sitting here next to my dissertation advisor, I had a class from Rich, a couple of classes from Rich when I was a grad student. I'll be talking about Dan Rubenfeld, who was an economist who taught in the law school. Uh, he was also on my dissertation committee, and then, of course, Gordon, who he and I go back gosh, almost 30 years now, or maybe even a little bit more. So it's really great to be here today, and meaningful on a lot of levels. Um, Berkeley, probably most of you know, has a great tradition in law and economics. And a lot of it has to do with regulation, with topics in industrial organization. But there's another part of law and economics here at Berkeley and beyond that I'd like to call your attention to. And that's the issue of environmental law and economics. It's another problem of regulation. It's an area where there's been a lot of research about the role of the legal system uh, in controlling pollution, and Gordon has played uh, an important part in that. So I'd like to start with just a little anecdote about a project that Gordon and I worked on some time ago in the early 1990s. And it's funny, when you work on things, you don't always realize at the time what's going to happen later on, whether they're going to be a big deal or not. And Gordon and I, he testified. I helped him with it. Uh, we had occasion to work on a case that actually became a landmark ruling in California environmental law. And that's the case of Mangini v. Aerojet General. Uh, Gordon did a bunch of 
or I should say I did, a bunch of very careful <laughs> econometric work to talk about environmental damages and measure the effects of groundwater contamination on this particular property in the Sacramento Valley. But the reason that case became interesting is it was a real good example of using nuisance law to deal with the problem of environmental contamination. And I'm gonna talk more generally about the economics of using the tort system to control environmental pollution. But Mangini was a good example of that because what it did, there's a distinction in California between a permanent nuisance and a continuing nuisance. The permanent nuisance is something that can't be abated. A continuing nuisance is something that in theory could be abated. And what the Mangini case did is for the first time established the principle that environmental pollution like soil and water pollution was a continuing nuisance, so expanded that doctrine. It was a continuing nuisance for which compensation could be paid, and our job was to figure out what that compensation would be. Now the case went on and on and on. Appeals went up to the Supreme Court in the state of California twice, and the monetary damage ultimately got reversed due to some underlying deficiencies in the plaintiff's presentation. But what the case did do, what's the legacy of it, is it established this principle that soil and water pollution uh, could be a continuing nuisance in California and that property owners could uh, sue for compensation and win. So that was a fun case to be a part of. Um, let me talk a little bit more generally about environmental law and economics and how the field has evolved here at Berkeley and, and what Gordon's role has been. Um, there are a lot of problems that people work on in environmental economics, climate change being kind of the paramount one, but a lot of problems that we work on are more local in nature. And in California, for example, it's hard to believe, but there are currently around 10,000 officially registered hazardous waste sites in the state. Now only about 1% are Superfund sites, there's I think 97, but there are 10,000 hazardous waste sites in California. And that's everything from, you know, a major, uh, you know, say a major underground storage facility to a corner dry cleaner that had been leaking dry cleaning fluid over the years, or a gas station, so kind of the whole gamut. But there are a lot of these in California, and managing that kind of environmental pollution is a big deal in this state and beyond. So economists think a lot about deterrence. How do we, how do we manage the amount of pollution that's in the environment? And a big question that we work on is, what are the best mechanisms to do that? And there is a distinction between ex ante prescriptive mechanisms that the government might impose, things like proper handling of hazardous waste or soft strategies like development of safety cultures, to, uh, on the other hand, ex post using the tort system to make polluters pay for the damage they're causing. These are sort of two fundamentally different approaches. And they can work together, of course, but analytically they're quite distinct. And where Gordon has made his contribution is really more in the economics of using the tort system to manage environmental consequences. So that, that's primarily what I'd like to talk about. Now I should say, to economists, the tort system has a lot of advantages. You know, we love the Coase theorem. We love the idea that as long as externalities are internalized, that corporations will act the right way. And if you think about it, that's what the tort system does. If a polluter causes some kind of damage and an injured party can go to the court system and sue for whatever is the cost of cleanup plus interim injuries that were suffered before the cleanup happens, well, hey, in theory, that could result in an efficient outcome and that you get the right amount of deterrence. So there's compensation for harm that results from the use of the tort system. The money collected goes to the people who are actually injured, so you satisfy a Pareto criterion. Uh, and informationally, it's efficient, too. You don't need to have a government agency that may have imperfect information about how an industry works. 
trying to make decisions about what's the optimal amount of precautionary expenditures, right? Corporations are gonna work it out on their own by assessing their liabilities. Now, the tort system has some downsides too. With all due respect to Michael, litigation's expensive. It can take a long time. You may get some unjust outcomes. There could be deficiencies in evidence, all kinds of barriers to compensation. So the tort system has a lot of appeal and it's a very powerful way to get corporations to behave, but it does have, uh, does have some limitations. Now back to the question of deterrence. Uh, economists have thought a lot about deterrence in an environmental context. And we make a distinction between absolute deterrence and what we call optimal deterrence or efficient deterrence. Absolute deterrence shows up a lot in the law and economics literature, but it's really almost more of a criminal law concept. Although there are environmental statutes that are based on absolute deterrence. For example, the Oil Pollution Act says something to the effect of oil spills should always be prevented, right? We never wanna have a violation. Um, and again, I say that's kind of from the criminal law context because if you think about something like kidnapping or bank robbery, there's not an optimal amount of kidnappings, right? Something that we should always try to prevent. And there are a number of instances where we think about environmental violations that way. But more commonly, in the context of the environment, we think about optimal deterrence. And optimal deterrence, of course, is gonna be very familiar to all the economists in the room, is more about balancing the costs of preventing accidents with uh, the effects of uh, the accident itself on third parties. So in the groundwater contamination case, the cost of preventing the contamination or the leakage, as opposed to what are the consequences of the contamination for third parties. So to understand optimal deterrence and to make the tort system work, we need to have mechanisms in place, we need to have economic models where we can understand accurately the costs of environmental contamination. And this is where I wanna transition into talking about some of Gordon's academic work. Um, now in the early 2000s, I think largely inspired by some work outside the university, Gordon together with Jill McCluskey, who's sitting right behind him, who's a graduate of our department and one of the real shining stars in the ag econ profession, uh, also one of the students I know Gordon is most proud of. Um, they published a series of papers, yes, um, they published a series of papers in uh, great outlets like Land Economics, Journal of Environmental Economics and Management, and the Review of Economics and Statistics, discovering ways that environmental contamination can affect real property, ways that it can affect real estate values. And they uncovered a number of things, but before I get into what that was, and I'll wrap up in a second, I do wanna mention Gordon published, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, all three of these papers while he was dean. Now, I just finished six years as department chair, handing off to Jeff. I know how hard that must have been, so <laughs> that is really impressive. Uh, but they got these papers done, and they found a number of, a number of interesting things. They demonstrated convincingly that proximity to hazardous waste sites can significantly impact property values. Well, that's common sense, but it had not been shown to the degree that they were able to show it using data from a number of different sites around the country, so that's an important insight. They also showed, interestingly, both theoretically and empirically, that environmental contamination can have temporary effects but also permanent effects on property values, even after the property is cleaned up. That's a phenomenon that you sometimes hear referred to as stigma. So they were one of the first economists to look at the problem of stigma in an environmental context. And again, did some, I think, very convincing work. Um, they were also ahead of their time in noting the role of the media and other sources of public information about the extent and severity of contamination in impacting uh, these real property values. 
information on risk and contamination can be confusing to the public and it can be difficult for the public to interpret, including people who are participating in real estate markets. And I'd also note, I'd actually forgotten this until I reread their paper last week, uh, one of their papers. They were very prescient. They may not even remember this, but there was a section of one of their papers where they had, it wasn't the main point, but they had a number of observations that looking at it now, I think were remarkable noting that there was neighborhood turnover, a change in the composition of who's living in these neighborhoods, both before and after contamination. And when I read that, I thought, wow, there's a whole bunch of economists now who are working on merging urban economics and environmental economics to get at questions of neighborhood sorting, really from an environmental justice context. But I thought those observations were, uh, I think, sort of anticipating a whole big literature now. Uh, so it was a pleasure to read that. Um, let me close, I've probably gone on too long, but let me, let me close just quickly, having worked with Gordon for a long time. Gordon is obviously incredibly smart, and he's worked in, close. Yep, worked in all kinds of areas, um, but he's also fun to work with, and he loves this place. So Gordon, it's been a real pleasure, and thank you for everything you've done for me. And Gareth, a few words. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to thank Gordon for having me on this panel. Um, I'd also like to thank him for giving me a job 10 years ago in, at his uh, consulting firm, On Point Analytics. There's a lot of people here from that firm today. Um, and I'd really just say that over those 10 years, I've learned a huge amount from you, Gordon, as to how expert testimony should, and from others, how it shouldn't be done um, from a sound economics point of view. Uh, I think it's a as you remind me often, it's a good basis for me for my future career, certainly. Um, and so in those 10 years, and what I like to talk about is that what we've really seen is a massive increase, in my view, and in a lot of people's views, in the standards for economic analysis in various different types of litigation, but particularly in uh, antitrust class actions. Um, so just to remind everyone, a class action is simply when a whole bunch of plaintiffs, hundreds or thousands of people or, or corporations bring an action against a defendant or a group of defendants. And whether or not the case can proceed as a class action has to be determined, decided by the court. And in making that determination, what the court has to, has to be convinced of is that there is common evidence that can be used to show that, that every, all or virtually all in the parlance, but we'll just simplify it to each class member has suffered some impact from the alleged bad acts by the defendants, um, and that there's a common economic model that can be used to calculate the damages, the economic damages from those bad acts in the aggregate across the class. So when I started working 10 years ago, uh, really uh, the standards were such that, that all really a class economist had to do was that they could appeal to there was a market that class members bought out of that market and the market had a pricing structure in the sense that prices moved up and down together, evidenced by average price at series analysis. And from that you could infer if the defendants manipulated prices that because of this co-movement and it's a market, you could infer that there would be a common impact that every class member would have suffered some impact. And also, 10 years ago, all an economist really had to do at class certification to convince the court to certify the class is that the economists would have to describe a damage model. They didn't have to implement their class-wide damage regression model. They just had to promise the court that they would be able to do so when it came to trial and describe regression models generally. Um, and that's the way a lot of class expert reports ended at that time. Um, and part of the reason for that was because at the class certification stage, the court wasn't really meant to make factual determinations. They weren't meant to decide the facts and things at that stage. That was for the jury to decide later. And the law was such that they were meant to decide class, class certification relatively quickly. So all of that changed in 2008, the first year I started working for Gordon with the hydrogen peroxide decision. And that decision it came about partly because the law had changed to say actually courts should maybe spend a bit longer thinking about whether or not it should be a class action or not. But that decision, hydrogen peroxide, uh, found that uh, you, really courts should look into factual disputes. So if one expert says, Here, here's average prices, they seem to move up and down together, there will have been a common impact. 
But another expert says, on the other side, the defendant's expert says, well, if you look under these averages, there's dispersion all over the place. There probably wasn't a common impact. That the court actually had to determine which one was right because that was relevant for class certification. Right? They had to resolve factual disputes that were relevant for class certification. And hydrogen peroxide also said that the court, instead of just taking an expert on his promise, his or her promise that they could run a model when they got to the trial, the court actually had to do a rigorous assessment of whether or not that model would actually work. What happened from that latter thing is that experts started to more often implement their regression models at the class certification stage to convince the court, hey, look, this thing actually works. Now, that all sounds perfectly reasonable. More rigorous analysis is never a bad thing. However, it led to a certain tension, and this touches a little bit on, I think, what Michael talked about in terms of like a, a miss, loss of understanding between e economics and the law. It led to a certain tension, in my view, because of two factors. The first factor was if you reject the sort of traditional market analysis and the looking at average price series to infer common impact, this creates a sort of co a, a vacuum as to how you prove common impact. The court says, well, what will convince me that every class member was harmed by what happened? What evidence will you use to do that? And the second factor is that because there was now an insistence that you should run an actual regression model, a class-wide regression model to calculate the aggregate damages, at the class certification stage, that filled the vacuum. So now the court could say, well, you've run this model, and I know the model is designed just to calculate aggregate class-wide damages, damages for everybody, but what does it tell us about whether every class member was individually harmed? Now, why is that a problem? And this comes to you know, the problems with understanding between law and economics to some extent. Economists all know that that a regression model is very good at estimating an average effect. It's very good at estimating aggregate damages across a class and average overcharge. It's not so good at estimating individual effects. And that's because to do so, you have to predict with pretty good accuracy what each class member would have paid but for the alleged antitrust violation. And because of that tension, in my view, things have become a lot more challenging. Um, and then just to touch on two other rulings, that made things, um, that, has, that has increased um, the standards and the challenge for economists. The first one is uh, the Comcast ruling. And the Comcast ruling really said that, okay, if you come up with a model and the bad guys are alleged to have done four bad things and your model captures the damages from those four bad things, but the court later on finds actually one of the, only really one of those things is illegal, you're gonna have to magically and easily transform your model into identifying the economic damages from just that one thing. That's actually a very, you know, not surprisingly, very difficult thing to do. And then the second ruling, and, and this is one that, that Michael touched on, uh, we're talking about the real freight fuel surcharges litigation, is that ruling suggested, it's not the law obviously, but it suggested that models should pass so-called false positives tests. And those false positive tests means that not only does your model have to estimate reliably damages for the affected transactions, but you should go out as the class economist and find some other transactions that you know were not affected by the antitrust violation and show that your model doesn't find any damages on those transactions. Finding such transactions is actually a very difficult thing to do in a market that's been manipulated, obviously. So to conclude, in the last challenging but very enjoyable 10 years, I think we've seen antitrust class actions go from a situation where the class economist just had to say, hey, your honor, don't worry about this. Come to trial. I will run a regression model to calculate class-wide damages. I'm not going to do it now. Just take my word on my professional reputation. I will be able to do it. We've gone from that to what you have to say, or if you get a particularly tough judge, what you may have to say is, I've run the model. Here it is. It works. It calculates class-wide damages. Not only that, it can show that each and every class member was impacted, and it passes all of these f possible false positive tests, and if your honor, you decide that of these four bad things that the bad guys were meant to have done, only one's illegal, I can just do a tweak, and we can work out the damages for that one thing on its own. So, um, and that's what I have to say, and uh, it's been a pleasure working with Gordon to meet those challenges, and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Gareth. Uh, Martin, you're next. Yes, yeah, so let me start with something that fits a law and economic session. I have to make a legal disclaimer, uh, namely that I only represent my own views and not the views of the Federal Reserve System and, and neither the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Um, I'm sure the Federal Reserve System has views on Gordon's work, um, but I do not represent them here. So 
let me start. I think the best thing about Gordon is his unbounded dedication to research. And let, let me give you a random example. So after a long and distinguished research career, everyone would relax on the evening of his or her fest trift, right? Hanging out with friends, having some beer, talking to your colleagues about the good old times, right? Not Gordon. So <laughs> he pushed me and he's determined to work on our ongoing research project tonight. So uh, <laughs> if you plan on hanging out with him, uh, we're going to work. You're going to sit in this little room and work on our computers, identification, and data. So um, he will continue to do this path-breaking research. And let me tell you a couple of words about this project. And I'm glad that Leopold is also here. He, he helped a lot with that project, um, in which we find that collusive action has a strong legacy effect on prices and output in commodity markets. So most um, class certification empirical frameworks that study the damages of collusive action are actually static and they are reduced form. And what we do in contrast to this, or the goal of our paper is to account for the dynamic um, the dynamics of collusive action and for the simultaneous determination of collusive action and prices. What does that mean in non-economic uh, uh, kind of language? It means the chicken and egg problem, right? So on the one hand side, collusive action might affect prices, but prices might also affect collusive action and might endogenously um, kind of set incentives um, to collude. And this is something that we're trying to solve in this paper. Uh, and we do so by applying kind of the most recent structural vector autoregressive time series models. So when I talk about time series model, we also need time series, right? And the example that we are uh, using here is um, the world copper market. A it's a quite homogeneous good over a very long time horizon. So we have collected data for the world copper market from 1820 to nowadays. And we have information about the quantities withhold from the copper market by eight different cartels and also quantities about their stock accumulations by which they try to manipulate prices. And we basically find three key preliminary results. So first is that collusive action only lasts for two years on average. And afterwards, for several reasons, these cartels typically break up. The cartel might still be legally around, but they're not active. But the damages amount to 400 billion US dollar in current dollars. That, that's quite a bit when you think, I mean, this is just the copper market. And so why is this? The reason is that there are strong legacy effects of collusive action, in particular on output. So this is the counterfactual price path. That's the, the red line here. And the black line is the, is, the, um, is the actual price. And then the red line is the counterfactual price. So the red line is the price. What would have been the price without collusive action? And you can see here, in the 1888s, you had a huge collusive action, kind of without that collusive action, prices would have been much lower, right? And you see that this has a quite persistent effect. And to make this a little bit easier to see, this is kind of the difference between these two lines. So you have this collusive action here that has a quite significant and long impact. Then you have further peaks here, which are also collusive action periods. And then we derive from that kind of the price damage and the output damage, both during the action periods and the unwinding periods. So why is output damage uh, so much higher than price damage? And uh, I just went to the restrooms and I had this idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gordon wrote this really great paper um, in the American Economic Review in the 1970s about extraction technology and learning by doing. So while you dig for that copper, you also learn about the geology 
about extraction technologies. And that's essentially the idea here. If you stop digging, you also stop learning. And so this has a persistent effect on productivity in that sector. And that could be one of the theoretical explanations for, for our findings here. So to conclude, it's important to account for these dynamic properties and also for the simultaneous determination of collusive action. So Gordon, let me thank you for being such a great mentor and for all our joint work. It was it's really a big pleasure to work with you and I'm, I'm really, really grateful for all that you have done for me. Um, let's see how far we get tonight. Uh, <laughs> I know that you, you're very determined, but please also consider to relax and have some fun time with your colleagues and uh, friends. Thank you. Great. And thank you for leaving some time so we can hear from our group if there are any questions. I think there are a lot of issues that have been raised. Uh, I have an issue. Um, so I want to get back to, to something certainly that Michael said, but actually it came up in a lot of other uh, discussion, which is um, in litigation uh, and in public policy generally, uh, it's my experience that uh, certainly courts, and I don't know about Congress, but courts at least, uh, aren't that bad, and even juries aren't that bad, at um, uh, getting the message. And often if they don't get the message, maybe it's because the economists aren't very good at delivering the message. Uh, but when it comes to actual computation of damages and impacts, uh, things that you know, not only Michael talked about, but I know David also talked about and others talked about indirectly, in my experience, you know, courts are hopeless about this. You're asking people to evaluate very complicated uh, econometric models when, you know, they, a lot of them can't balance their checkbook. Uh, and, uh, you know, how are they going to do this? And I, I've always thought that what we should have is, you know, maybe we should have a green eye shade department where in a lot of these issues, uh, there's a determination on the merits, uh, whether there's liability for something or other. And then it goes off to somebody, it does CBO or whatever, uh, and they figure out what the number is. Now, I mentioned this to, to an attorney once, and he said, that's fine if you want to repeal the Constitution. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that that's necessary. Uh, but I, I just wonder if um, you, know, you have some views about that, any of us. I think with regard to the computation of damage, that's where you see the greatest difficulty you know, that courts have in understanding regressions. Um, and when you say you know, you've got to um, change the Constitution, the concept that you don't have two economists looking at the same data coming to the same conclusions is, is, is not a shocker. Um, that was the purpose of, of the jury or, or the court in saying, okay, between these two ranges, this is where I feel you know, um, the damage lies. That's why for purposes of finding a damage, you're not looking necessarily for precision. You're looking for a degree of certainty which match, matches the facts of the of observable market realities. However, I do think that there are also some issues with regard um, to policy. Uh, you're getting courts less and less uh, open to hearing from economists on whether or not certain conduct constitutes an agreement. Um, in violation of the antitrust laws. Um, today, there's issues of signaling, you know, issues of, of uh, um, overlapping shareholder investors dictating, you know, what you know companies uh, that, that competing companies do, um, not for purposes of what would be best for the individual company, but for what would be best for the investors as a group with regard to an industry as a whole. Um, then I have an issue with regard to in, environmental law um, uh, or in, environmental economics, where in situations <clears throat> involving, for example, indigenous people, I, I don't think you know, um, the economics works in a litigation um, setting. In the Exxon Valdez oil spill, there was a question of calculating uh, the damage to the indigenous populations caused by the spill. Well, it was easy for the commercial fishermen 
because they could just say, okay, this is what I caught in the you know, X years you know, b before, and um, this is what I think will be my catch going forward. But what do you do with the indigenous people um, who basically don't catch you know, fish or, or um, hunt animals for purposes of resale? Uh, the economics there was that the court needed to consider the fact that the indigenous um, population actually benefited by the spill, because before the spill, they went out and leisurely fished and hunted and gathered and shared, but earned no income. Whereas after the spill, they were being paid by Exxon for cleaning up you know, the, the contamination caused by the spill. Um, and then it came to a quantification with regard to um, the, the fish and, and, and the animals or the, the subsistence way of life that was damaged. And the court said, well, what you need to do is give me an estimate of what the indigenous people consumed in years before and what type of consumption it was, whether it was be fish you know, or deer or bear, and then go to an aquarium and find out how much so, uh, it would cost me to replace those fish and how much it would cost me to replace the, uh, the zoo at a bear, you know, the bear at a zoo or, um, you know, or the, the deer you know, in a park. So uh, but again- on the narrow topic, I just wanna say on mm -hmm. the narrow topic, of uh, damage calculations in these models. It's, it's I, the worst. I, yeah, I've never seen a case where the plaintiff's estimate of damages is less than the defendant's uh, <laughs> estimate of damages. And uh, you know, if you were thinking that they were really trying to both to get a good shot at it, that sometimes that would happen. You know, or, it's just the way it happened. You know? Doing the corollary, you never see a defendant say that the plaintiff doesn't owe me money because I really did a good job. Yeah. Well, they do. Huh? So we only have one minute. Is there anything good? We have a question. So I was wondering how, um, how can current antitrust law be used to address the market power that is being exercised right now by the, by the big four? Oh, the big four. You have to read yeah. my book. OK. I have a book on it. <laughs> That's what you, OK. I need to read your book. It's a sound bite. It's not worth reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have to move. There is a sound bite. You have to move from price-centric antitrust to innovation-centric antitrust. That's the sound. We're, right? we're not there. We got a long way to go. That's a whole other panel. But. Well, thank you all very much.